are temporary, then that means that that definition that we exist in is also temporary and as a result cannot be truth. Truth is anchored in eternity because truth is who he is. So this morning I want to talk a little bit, I won't take too much of your time, but I want to talk a little bit about the wealthy place. I want to get into the meat and potatoes of wealth. Like we've been talking about wealth for quite a few weeks now, right? For a while. So staying in that same vein and in that same lane, I'm going to come from Psalm 66, verse 12. As more of an anchor, anchored scripture, but we'll touch on some other scriptures to help to support the point. Amen? All right, Psalm 66, 12 says, Thou has caused men to ride over our heads. We went through the fire and through water, but thou brought us out and into a wealthy place. Out and into a wealthy place. Now, for the sake of context, this is referring to the land of Canaan which, as we know, was set aside for the Israelites. Some look at a wealthy place in this verse as it relates to money, right? But it's much more than just that. Others define it as a spacious space, freedom, and a place of rest. Even others define it as liberty, prosperity, and overflowing and abundance. So what does God see this wealthy place as? In order to get to that, I think we have to first talk about, well, what is wealth? <laughs> the general definition is wealth is based on the accumulation of valuable assets, resources that have economic value that can then be converted and used for transactions, right? So just in that, we understand that wealth by the world's definition was never supposed to be relational. It was supposed to be transactional and exchange. It's determined by subtracting all debts from the total market value of those physical, intangible assets, typically things that you can interact with with your senses, right? Stuff. This is stuff that's usually owned by a person, a company, etc. This is also known as net worth. Sometimes you go on Google, you look up what's the net worth of such and such, right? But always understand that this type of wealth or net worth can depreciate over time. I like to call this momentary wealth. Well, it's, it's not eternal. It, it can't be. Right, because it's based on a world system. 
So typically there are four main components of wealth. The first one is assets. Something of value that is owned. It's not really an asset if it's not owned. But if you think about the world that we live in and everything in it, from the world's perspective, it's owned by somebody, right? Okay, so something of value that's owned. The second component of wealth is debt, right? Something owed. Something owed. And I found this interesting because I'm still hearing ownership in all of that. The third component, income. Income. Payment received in exchange for something. Income. And then the, the fourth component, expenses. The cost required for something. That's the stuff that we have to pay for. Most would say the bills. <laughs> right? So that is the world system's definition of wealth. That being the case, and us just identifying that wealth comes from truth, and he is truth, then there has to be a truth-based definition of wealth. Proverbs 10, 22 says, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich. And he adds no sorrow to it. Sorrow. Sometimes the sorrow can be just having the stuff. Have you ever had something, and before you had it, you just thought, i got to get that. I've got to own that. And then you own it, and you realize that it came with a whole lot of sorrow. Well, if I knew this is, oh, man, if I knew it was going to be like this, right? Psalms 112, 2 through 3 says, their children will be successful everywhere. An entire generation of godly people will be blessed. They themselves will be wealthy. And their good deeds will last forever. That forever is eternity, which we know is anchored in truth. All right, so we talked about the four main components of wealth, right? So we have to talk about the same four main components of wealth in the sense of true wealth. Or is it truth wealth? So we talked about the first one being assets. Something of value that is owned. So based on truth, wealth, Psalms 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, everything. If I can just step to the side a little bit. Everything. Everything. The world and all who live in it. This is the all. Outside is the all. Everything and every one. You, you got to grab this now because this is God talking about how he views an asset. First Corinthians 6 19 says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. 
so if wealth is based on truth and truth is within me, then that must mean that wealth is also within me. We're going somewhere. The temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from who? From God. And that you are not your own. Ownership. Not your own. Okay, all right. 1 Corinthians 7.23 says, we were bought with a price. So now we're, we're getting into the value part, right? Because you don't buy something that has no value. The reason that it has a price is because that price is attached to a value of that item, right? Or that thing. All right. So that's the first uh, aspect or component. The second is debt. We all understand what debt is, right? Okay, I'm speaking to the right church. Something owned. Owed. That's debt. Something owed. Usually comes around a certain time of the month. Whatever that date is that that thing lands on, it needs to be paid. It needs to be paid because, well, it's owed. However, <laughs> however, Colossians 2, 14 says, I love this scripture. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. Canceled. You remember a couple years ago when they were canceling student loans? And that was like such a blessing, right? But that was just one aspect of debt. Can you imagine having everything associated with debt canceled? Who, who could do that? Who would be so merciful? <laughs> Let's talk about income. Income is payment received in exchange for labor or a product, right? Well, 1 Corinthians 7.23 says, again, you were bought at a price. Then there's expenses, the cost required for someone. Ephesians 2.8 says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It's a gift from God. That's one of the great things about a gift. You don't have to pay for it. It's a gift. So we now have the truth definition of wealth. I promise I won't be too long. So just some bullets about truth wealth, or we'll call it eternal wealth. Truth wealth is freeing and liberating. If you've ever paid something off and experienced that freedom of paying that thing off, no longer having that debt. <laughs> Truth wealth provides that at a supernatural level. It means that it goes above and beyond. It, it's exponential in the way that it's expressed. Truth wealth transitions us from survival mode into purposeful mode. See, survival mode is a mode that's triggered by the condition, by the system that in its very nature was never designed to support our purpose, but the purpose of those who designed it. Amen? We were designed and built to dwell in purpose mode. We were created by an intentional God, a purposeful God. So if a purposeful God created me, then he had to create me with an intention. 
a purpose, and that is my mandate. But the condition, right? True, truth wealth takes us from the limits of these control systems and places us in the governance and leadership of God. And we know that he leads from a place of love and he leads from a place of wealth. I'm going somewhere. Truth wealth aligns us back to our purpose and our destiny, which leads to fulfillment. Have you ever had a job and you go to work, you work, you leave, sleep, repeat, and Although that job provides some of the resources necessary, you just knew it's not what you should be doing. It's not what you were called to do. You just, it just lacks, what's that word? Fulfillment. Conversely, you could be at a job that doesn't necessarily provide all the financial resources, but man, it is fulfilling. I'll just, on a side note, I'll just say, I think that's how teachers feel, our educators. I wish we celebrated them in a tangible way more than we do, amen? Truth wealth, it never depreciates. But you've got to, you got to get this. But it increases in its expression as agreement appreciates. The more that you agree with truth wealth, the more it's expressed out of you and into your life and the lives of others. That's appreciation. It is growing. Amen? So I want to pause a little bit and, and touch on what I would consider unwealthy behavior. And when I say unwealthy, I'm talking about opposite to truth, wealth, behavior. We know that there's a way that the wealthy behaves based on nature. We're talking about dollars and cents. But then if there is a truth wealth, then there should be also a truth wealth behavior, right? Let's talk about what that is not and what that typically looks like. On wealthy behavior seeks validation. It seeks validation. It's usually offense based, right? As a result of something that I've experienced, something in me is now triggered to where I have to be validated. It causes us to see ourselves in a negative way. You think about someone that's just rich, seems to have everything, success, fame, and yet they take their own lives. Unwealthy behavior seeks validation. The next point of unwealthy behavior, it's based off qualification thinking which is also fear-based, right? And we know that this must take a back seat to God's truth about you and me. What are some qualifiers? Well, I guess we can start with stuff, right? What do I drive? 
Where do I live? How do I dress? What brands do I have hanging off me? Right? Now, I'm not saying that these things in and of themselves are unhealthy. It's the motive that's unhealthy. What's driving you to these things? Nothing wrong with liking nice things. But I'm always going to ask, why do you like it? Especially when I see a price tag that's a couple hundred dollars, and I look at the item, and this might be just me, my, and my opinion, right? Who made that? And why? It doesn't even hang right. It has no swag to it. But regardless of how it looks, I understand in this unhealthy expression that if I wear it, I'm then going to be associated with the price of the thing. It's like driving that cyber truck. Is it just me? A, a door wedge on wheels, right? But we understand how much it costs. So if I'm driving that, I'm going to be associated with the cost of the thing. And so as a result, I feel qualified. Right? And validated. Oh, I'm doing something now. Right? I'm feeling myself. But when I'm feeling myself, I'm expressing feelings about myself. It's emotional. How will I feel tomorrow? When I look in the mirror and it's still me. Unwealthy behavior. What about justification? which is also fear-based and subjugates us back to ideological limits. The limits that we put on ourselves or that the condition puts on us that's not supposed to be there. How are you limited when you serve a limitless God? And so when we think about the glass ceiling, if I could see through it, then why is it there? With God, there is no ceiling. <laughs> there is no limit, right? So unwealthy behavior seeks justification, justification for behavior. Sometimes... Wealth makes you do some things. You look at the behavior that we see across the media, right? And you're like, wow. But wealth somehow justifies the behavior. All right? All right, so we've talked about wealth based on the world system. We talked about wealth based on truth. We've covered up some unwealthy behavior. Now let's look at Matthew 21, 18 through 19. In the morning, as Jesus was returning from Jerusalem, he was hungry. And he noticed a fig tree in a distance on the side of the road. So he went over to the tree to see if there were any figs on it. But there were only leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. And immediately the fig tree withered up. All right, so you, at first glance when you read the text, okay, well, he saw the tree, he went to the tree, the tree had leaves on it, but it had no figs. So obviously it was a healthy tree. Why would he cause it to wither up? 
Well, here's the thing about figs and fig trees. Based on the way that the fig tree produces its fruit, the fruit tends to start coming out before the leaves do. So when you see leaves on a fig tree, you know that it should be bearing fruit. So Jesus approached this tree that's supposed to be producing something that has, the tree has a purpose. The purpose of a fig tree is twofold. One is to produce figs and to reproduce fig trees. We talked about that exponential reproduction, right? So if the tree is supposed to produce fruit and God sees that it doesn't, and has a problem with that, then I have to then look at myself. Am I just full of leaves? Am I just good for a, a shade? Or am I producing something that can feed others and something that can reproduce and create mini me's? Right? See, God put this system in place. Once he created everything, he no longer, no longer needed to create. When he said that on the seventh day he rested, it means that it was finished. There was a system in place of reproduction that was supposed to continue and continue and continue and continue. And that's the position that truth wealth comes from. It's not supposed to stop with me and just my generation. It exceeds and surpasses generation. We're talking about eternity. All right, so if we talked about unwealthy behavior, then we have to talk about wealthy behavior. What does that look like? Right? Wealthy behavior is based on truth. Right? The same truth, Father, that dwells in me. So then, my producing and expressing or experiencing wealth is based on my agreement with that truth. I don't believe that you can truly express and experience wealth without agreement. I'll prove it to you. So let's, in the natural. Let's say I'm wealthy. I have X amount at the bank. If it just sits at the bank and I never agree that it exists, I will never move to make a withdrawal or to use it, right? So I go to the bank, I pull out a card, and when I insert that card into the machine, I'm inserting that card into the machine based on a truth that I agree with, an existence that I agree with. To the point and to the degree that when I put it in there, I have an expectation. How often do we have an expectation of the wealth that's within us? God does. We saw that with the fig tree. He had an expectation of that tree. The wealth in that tree was its ability to produce fruit in order to reproduce. If it's not producing fruit, it can't reproduce. Wealth behavior. Wealth is supposed to 
produce wealth. Just as much as a fig tree is supposed to produce fig trees. One of the things I love about growing up in the islands is just the fruit trees. <laughs> Mango is one of my favorite fruits. I remember coming home from school, dropping my backpack, and climbing the tree. And just sitting in a mango tree, eating mangoes for hours. I didn't need a knife to peel them. God gave me everything to peel them with. <laughs> mango just running down my arm. Just, just, just some of my favorite memories. But can you imagine if I came home from school and that tree had no fruits on it? <laughs> what? kind of mental state would that put me in? You see, I had an expectation, right? The wealth in you, which is your purpose and your destiny, was designed to bear fruit. In other words, it was designed to be expressed out of you. Out of you, the wealthy place. Wealthy tree, wealthy branches, wealthy branches that have wealthy fruit hanging off of it. Those wealthy fruits have what inside of them? No, wealthy seed. Not just seeds. Yeah, understand that. Not just seed. Wealthy seed. Eternal seed. Seed that's not limited by the condition. Seed that grows in spite of. Seed that has a destiny tied to it that says, I will produce another me as he did. The word says he created us in his image so that we can express him here the way that he does there. So he has an expectation that expressing is going to happen, right? All right. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. That's the word. So if that's the word, and we know the word is truth, then I can anchor my expectations on that word. I will produce fruit. There's a caveat. There's a caveat. We can't read over that. If you remain in me. I'm surrounded by women, my mom, my sister-in-law. They have these green thumbs, right? Mine's is trying to get there, but I'll kill plants every now and then. Anything that they plant just grows to the point that they'll have a little piece of a plant planted, and in two years, you'll see three, four pots of the same plant. Well, when did you get these other ones? I didn't. They came from the original one. Exponential growth. I believe that they already have an expectation when they get that small thing that it's going to exponentially grow and reproduce to the point that they probably are already looking at what pots they're going to put them in. Preparation. How can you experience wealth without being able to manage wealth and being prepared for wealth. The process that God has us in is to prepare us for the expression of the thing. We have to be able to handle it. I'm not going to give my 14-year-old the keys to the car without first teaching him how to drive and understanding the responsibilities of what he's about to do. 
I'm not going to give my son his inheritance before time. Understand, when it's time for him to get that inheritance, he would have already gone through the process to not waste that thing. The process develops him and teaches him how to be a good steward. It teaches him that he also is the wealthy place. A wealthy tree that does not bear wealthy fruit is still a wealthy tree. I need you to understand that. A wealthy tree that bears, that does not bear wealthy fruit is still a wealthy tree. Your truth is not established in your fruit. Your truth is established in your root. We've got to get this. We've got to understand this. The wealthy tree that is not bearing wealthy fruit might just be in need of a little pruning. Sometimes you got to cut it back so it can grow and so it can produce, right? Right? The pruning is the process that's not always comfortable. You know the saying, growth never happens in a comfortable place. You go to the gym, say, I want to grow some muscles, right? Well, there's got to be some conflict. See, we think of conflict, and we think of conflict as a negative thing. Conflict is a good thing when you handle conflict correctly. How do I handle conflict correctly? Let's talk about that real quick. So I go to the gym and I want to get big biceps. Not that they're not big enough, right? I want to get bigger biceps. So I pick up this weight and I start doing some curls and doing some curls and the trainer comes over and says, your form is wrong, right? My form is wrong. So your process is not correct. So he tells me to maintain a certain form and as a result of being obedient, listening, taking counsel, I make an adjustment that now produces that that, I, that meets the expectation I had. Because I, I don't go to the gym if I don't expect to walk out of there better than when I walked in there. Amen? Otherwise, I'll go find something else to do. Like eat something, right? If I'm going to give up my eating time for exercise time, I better see some results. Because when I eat, I see results. Right? <laughs> Who eats without an expectation? I have an expectation first that it's going to taste good and it's going to fill me. Right? All right. <laughs> so we say that tr your truth is not established in your fruit. It's established in your root. Out of your identity, out of your truth, you're supposed to produce truth fruit. Out of your identity, you're supposed to pro produce identity fruit. Right? You are the wealthy place. I know you don't always feel that way. I know the world doesn't always tell you that you are. But it's not about what the world says, right? If it were, then I'd just be exhibiting unwealthy behavior, needing validation, justification, right? In wealthy behavior, regardless of what I feel, I understand that my truth is still my truth because it's where I am anchored. It's where my roots are. Now, because I don't see any fruit, I have to then be available and open to pruning. You are the wealthy place. I am the wealthy place. So it brings us back to Psalm 66 and 12, and I'll close with this. 
Again, it says, thou hath caused men to ride over our heads. That's, that's pain. Anybody ever felt like they've been walked over? You walk, just walk all over me. Roll on out the way then. <laughs> I'm just saying, speed bumps don't move, but I'm not going to lay there and get run over. Right? We went through the fire and through water. There is a process in meteorology, meteorology called annealing. It's where you take metal, you heat it up in the fire, you cool it down in water, you heat it up in the fire, you cool it down in the water, and every cycle that you do with that, it gets stronger. This is God saying, you went through the fire and through the water, And I brought you out into a wealthy place, into a deeper relationship with me. He dwells in me. He is the wealthy place. That makes me the wealthy place. The process is necessary. Even if you inherit wealth as his sons and daughters, there was the, you didn't have to work for it, but you still had to go through the process of preparation for it. We are the seeds planted in him, who is the wealthy place. And he has an expectation. Our purpose is to grow in him, mature in him, and reproduce wealth as wealthy places. And that is our truth. Proverbs 3, 9, 10 in closing says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine now you're feeding multitudes it was never about us we were never supposed to be storehouses we were designed to be distribution centers it comes in, and it goes out. Amen? Amen. Amen. I hope that blessed you.